she wasn't orphaned and she doesn't even have bleached blonde hair. Ladies and gentlemen, Emmy Lou Harris. I, and it reminded me of how much I love singing with him. Well, I dreamed I saw the knights in armor come. Emmy Lou Harris has indeed left an indelible mark on the country music scene, earning widespread respect and numerous awards throughout her illustrious career. However, beyond her musical talents, there's much more to know about her life and journey in the spotlight. Overcoming a lot of challenges and difficulties, how is she living after decades of influence in the entertainment industry? Join us as we delve into what really happened to Emmylou Harris. The start of Emmylou Harris's journey to stardom. Emmylou Harris, born on April 2, 1947, hails from a family with a strong military background. Her father, Walter Harris, served as a Marine Corps officer, while her mother, Eugenia, navigated the challenges of being a wartime military wife. Walter Harris experienced the turmoil of war firsthand, being reported missing in action during the Korean War and spending 10 months as a prisoner of war originally from Birmingham, Alabama. Emmylou spent her formative years moving between North Carolina and Woodbridge, Virginia. She excelled academically, graduating as the valedictorian from Garfield Senior High School in Virginia. Her passion for music ignited during her time at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, where she initially pursued a drama scholarship. Her musical palette expanded further thanks to her brother's extensive collection of country music albums. However, during her time at UNC Greensboro, Emmylou took part in various productions, including plays like The Tempest and The Dancing Donkey. Alongside her theatrical pursuits, she co-founded a folk music duo called The Emerald City, the duo performed gigs primarily at local coffee houses, immersing themselves in the burgeoning folk scene. Emmylou's path eventually took a different turn in 1967, when she decided to leave UNC Greensboro. She briefly tried her hand at Boston University, but soon realized her passion lay in folk music. She was inspired by artists like Pete Seeger, Bob Dylan, and Joan Baez. Opting for a full-time career as a folk singer, she embarked on a journey that would define her future. Leaving academia behind, Harris moved to Virginia Beach, where she worked as a waitress and continued to hone her singing skills. Yet the allure of Greenwich Village's vibrant folk music scene beckoned, and she soon found herself in New York City in the heart of the folk revival of the 1960s. Emmylou's marriage to fellow songwriter Tom Slocum in 1969 marked another significant personal milestone. Shortly thereafter, she welcomed her first child into the world. Mika Haley Slocum. At the same time, she forged connections with fellow musicians like Jerry Jeff Walker, Dave Bromberg, and Paul Siebel, immersing herself in the folk milieu. Performing at renowned venues such as The Bitter End, Emmylou honed her craft while juggling various odd jobs, from waitressing to cashiering at a bookstore. Unfortunately, life in Greenwich Village wasn't glamorous for Emmylou. Along with her husband and daughter, she resided at a nearby YWCA, navigating the challenges of pursuing her musical aspirations while balancing the responsibilities of parenthood. Despite the hardships, her talent caught the attention of a manager, leading to a record deal with Jubilee Records in 1969. Her debut studio album, Gliding Bird, released in 1970, showcased Emmylou's songwriting skills alongside tracks penned by her then-husband, Tom Slocum. Unlike her later work, this album bore the name Emmy Lou Harris. However, Jubilee Records faced financial woes, declaring bankruptcy shortly after the album's release. Undeterred, she and her husband made a pivotal decision to relocate to Nashville, Tennessee, the heart of country music. However, the strain of the music industry took its toll on their marriage, resulting in divorce. Emmylou found herself struggling to make ends meet, relying on food stamps and Medicaid to survive. Faced with financial hardship, she made the difficult choice to return to her parents' home in Clarksville, Maryland, in Washington, D.C. Despite setbacks, she remained determined to pursue her musical dreams. She secured a job as a hostess in Columbia, Maryland, demonstrating her resilience in the face of adversity. It was also in D.C. where Emmy Lou found mentors in Bill and Taffy Danoff, who nurtured her talent and introduced her to the local music circuit. In 1971, her talent caught the attention of the Flying Burrito Brothers during one of her performances. Chris Hillman, impressed by her voice, considered inviting her to join the band. Instead, he recommended her to Graeme Parsons for his solo project. 
Their collaboration began when Parsons invited Harris to Los Angeles to record with him, leading to a fruitful partnership. Emmylou fondly recalls their musical synergy, describing it as akin to dancing partners effortlessly finding their rhythm. Parsons' influence extended beyond their collaboration, as he made country music cool for a new generation of listeners. Tragically, Parsons passed away in 1973 due to a drug overdose at the young age of 26, leaving behind unfinished work. His posthumous album, Grievous Angel, featured several tracks recorded with Emmylou Harris. Despite the loss, their musical synergy left an indelible mark on the music industry. Emmylou Harris, finally getting recognition. Emmylou's breakthrough came with her major label debut album, Pieces of the Sky, produced by Canadian producer Brian Ahern. The album showcased her versatility, blending diverse influences ranging from the Beatles to Merle Haggard. With the support of seasoned musicians, the record marked a milestone in her career. The release of Pieces of the Sky introduced Emmylou Harris to a broader audience, earning her critical acclaim and commercial success. Her rendition of If I Could Only Win Your Love became her first major hit, defying the conventions of traditional country albums focused solely on a single track. This success paved the way for her enduring legacy as a pioneer in the country music scene. Take Elite Hotel, for instance. It topped the country charts and even found favor with rock audiences. It also secured a spot in the Billboard 200 Top 25, featuring covers of classics like Buck Owens's Together Again and Patsy Cline's Sweet Dreams. Elite Hotel showcased Harris's versatility and reverence for country music's rich heritage. For this project, she assembled a new backing group called The Hot Band, which included luminaries like James Burton and Glenn D. Harden, former members of Elvis Presley's band, along with Rodney Crowell. This wasn't your usual crossover attempt. Harris's music appealed to those who often turned their noses up at country's flirtations with pop. In fact, Elite Hotel snagged a Grammy in 1976 for Best Country Vocal Performance by a Female. Critically acclaimed and commercially successful, Harris's albums earned praise from reviewers and fans alike. Adam Sweeting of The Guardian hailed Pieces of the Sky for its many brilliant songs, while Jason Ankeny of All Music lauded Elite Hotel as one of her most heartfelt tributes to Graham Parsons, featuring eclectic covers that showcased her range as an artist. Grant Alden of No Depression described both albums as an astonishing, almost blemish-free collection when listened to from start to finish. Moreover, both Pieces of the Sky and Elite Hotel achieved gold certification in the United States, a testament to their enduring popularity and influence. But Emmylou Harris wasn't just basking in her solo success. She was in demand as a collaborator, too. Her guest appearances on albums by Linda Ronstadt, Guy Clark, and Neil Young showcased her versatility. Bob Dylan even tapped her for his Desire album, a testament to her growing reputation. Harris's live performance of Evangeline in Martin Scorsese's iconic film The Last Waltz further solidified her status as a sought-after talent. Emmylou Harris's record label had big plans for her, envisioning a shift towards country pop crossover stardom. However, Harris had other ideas. Instead, she opted to stay true to her traditional roots, embarking on a journey that would produce two landmark albums. The first, Blue Kentucky Girl, released in 1979, showcased her commitment to traditional country music. It quickly became a top 10 hit on the North American country charts, earning a gold certification and even snagging a Grammy Award for Best Female Country Vocal Performance. It featured classics reminiscent of country legends like Loretta Lynn and Kitty Wells. Songs like Every Time You Leave and Sisters Coming Home showcased her ability to breathe new life into traditional tunes. Critics also praised Harris's crystal clear voice, cementing her reputation as a leading figure in the genre. Following the success of Blue Kentucky Girl, Harris continued to push boundaries with her next album, Roses in the Snow, released in 1980. This album delved into bluegrass sounds, a departure from her previous work. Like its predecessor, Roses in the Snow achieved gold status and reached the number two spot on the country charts in both the US and Canada. The addition of Ricky Skaggs to her band infused the album with a fresh bluegrass sound, earning acclaim from both fans and critics alike. During this prolific period, Harris also welcomed the arrival of her second daughter and took a brief hiatus from touring. However, she remained as productive as ever, releasing the Christmas-themed album Light of the Stable in 1979, followed by Evangeline in 1981. Evangeline, a studio collection featuring previously unreleased tracks, achieved gold status 
and climbed to number five on the U.S. country chart. The album's cover of Mr. Sandman became a chart-topping hit, reaching the top 10 on the U.S. country chart and even breaking into the pop top 40. In addition to her solo efforts, Harris collaborated with music legend Roy Orbison on the hit single That Lovin' You Feeling Again, which earned them a Grammy Award for Best Country Vocal Performance by a Duo or Group. This further cemented Harris's status as a versatile artist. The Ups and Down of Emmylou Harris's Career Around 1981, Emmylou Harris underwent some changes in her band lineup. Ricky Skaggs, a prominent member of the Hot Band, departed, and Barry Tashian took his place. Additionally, drummer John Ware left, prompting Harris to reform the Hot Band with fresh faces. With this new lineup, Harris embarked on her next studio album, Cimarron, released in 1981. This album marked a significant milestone in her career, making its way into the top 10 of the U.S. Country Albums chart and reaching the top 50 of the all-genre Billboard 200 chart. It boasted hit singles like Born to Run and Tennessee Rose. both of which climbed into the top 10 on both U.S. and Canadian country charts. A standout duet with Don Williams titled If I Needed You even topped the Canadian country chart. Following the success of Cimarron, Harris and the Hot Band went on to record her first live album, Last Date, in 1982. The lead single, a vocal rendition of Floyd Kramer's Last Date, soared to the top of the U.S. country chart, followed closely by the top five hit, I'm Moving On. While both albums received mixed reviews from critics, they undeniably showcased Harris's prowess as a live performer and her ability to breathe new life into classic songs. Harris's professional and personal life saw significant changes during this period. Her collaboration with producer Brian Ahern came to an end with the release of her 1983 album White Shoes, coinciding with their divorce. Despite featuring covers of songs by other artists such as Pledging My Love and In My Dreams, which both achieved top 10 status on country charts, White Shoes didn't reach the same heights as her previous albums, peaking at number 22 on the U.S. country chart. Subsequently, Harris made a move to Nashville, where she joined forces with new producer Paul Kennerly. Together, they crafted The Ballad of Sally Rose, released in 1985. This album, featuring compositions written by Harris herself, offered a glimpse into her own life and career. While it reached the top 10 on the U.S. country chart, it failed to meet commercial expectations, despite critical acclaim for its musical diversity. In 1987, Harris embarked on a landmark collaboration with Dolly Parton and Linda Ronstadt, culminating in the release of the studio album, Trio. The trio's long-standing friendship translated into harmonious performances and resulted in one of Harris's best-selling albums to date. Trio topped the U.S. country chart, reached number six on the all-genre list, and spawned several top 10 country singles. As the 1980s drew to a close, Harris continued to explore new musical territories with albums like Bluebird in 1989 and Brand New Dance in 1990. While Bluebird showcased her country rock sensibilities and returned her to the top 10 as a solo artist, Brand New Dance received lukewarm reviews, with critics noting a lack of engagement with the material. Eventually, Emmylou Harris decided to shake things up in her career in the early 1990s. She bid farewell to the hot band and formed a new backing group known as the Nash Ramblers. This fresh ensemble included talented musicians like Sam Bush, Al Perkins, and John Randall. In the spring of 1991, Harris and the Nash Ramblers took to the stage at the Ryman for three unforgettable nights of music, with only 200 lucky guests in attendance. The result was the critically acclaimed live album titled At the Ryman. Not only did it garner rave reviews, but it also sparked renewed interest in the historic venue. In the months following the album's release, the Ryman underwent significant refurbishment, solidifying its status as a landmark in country music history. During this period, Harris held the prestigious position of president at the Country Music Foundation. Additionally, in 1992, she achieved a lifelong dream by becoming an official member of the Grand Ole Opry, a significant milestone in her career. Around the same time, Harris parted ways with Warner Reprise and signed a new contract with Asylum Records. In 1993, Asylum Records released Cowgirl's Prayer, Harris's final project produced by Paul Kennerly, with whom she also ended her marriage. Although the album received critical acclaim, it faced challenges with radio airplay for its singles. Despite this, Cowgirl's Prayer 
managed to make its mark on the country charts in both the U.S. and Canada. By the mid-1990s, Harris began to feel alienated by mainstream country radio. However, her move to Asylum Records allowed her the creative freedom to explore new musical territories. This newfound artistic freedom culminated in the release of the groundbreaking album Wrecking Ball, in 1995. Produced by Daniel Lenoir, known for his work with U2 and Peter Gabriel, Wrecking Ball introduced an alternative rock style to Harris's sound, paving the way for the emergence of the Americana music genre. Despite being overlooked by the country establishment, the album received widespread acclaim, earning Harris a Grammy Award for Best Contemporary Folk Album. In 1998, Harris treated fans to her third live album, Spy Boy, featuring live renditions of songs from throughout her illustrious career. The same year, she collaborated with Willie Nelson on his album, Teatro, produced by none other than Daniel Lenoir. In 1999, Asylum Records released Trio 2, the long-awaited follow-up to Harris's collaborative album with Dolly Parton and Linda Ronstadt. Despite its delayed release, Trio 2 soared to the top of the country album charts in both the U.S. and Canada, earning the trio a Grammy Award for Best Country Collaboration with Vocals. Meanwhile, Harris and Ronstadt fulfilled their own dream of releasing a collaborative album, Western Wall The Tucson Sessions, which quickly climbed the country charts and earned widespread acclaim for its rich harmonies and poignant songwriting. Both Western Wall and Harris's solo album, Red Dirt Girl, achieved success, landing in the top 10 of Billboard's country albums chart and garnering attention on the pop charts. How Emmy Lou Harris Became a Songwriter Around the turn of the millennium, Emmy Lou Harris underwent significant changes in her career. In 2000, she parted ways with her record label and management, seeking new opportunities. That same year, she signed with Nonesuch Records, marking a fresh start for her musical journey. Nonesuch Records released her first solo studio album in five years, titled Red Dirt Girl. This album marked a departure from her previous works, as it featured mostly self-written songs, showcasing Harris's songwriting talents. Notably, the album included contributions from acclaimed artists like Bruce Springsteen and Patti Griffin, adding depth to its sound. Red Dirt Girl received widespread acclaim from critics and audiences alike. It climbed to number five on the U.S. Country Albums chart and garnered attention across various other charts globally. The album's single, I Don't Want to Talk About It Now, marked a milestone for Harris, becoming her first track to make the U.S. Adult Alternative Airplay chart. Additionally, Red Dirt Girl earned Harris another Grammy Award for Best Contemporary Folk Album, solidifying her status as a revered artist in the folk music scene. During this period, Harris also made significant contributions to the soundtrack of the critically acclaimed film Oh Brother, Where Art Thou, which won a Grammy for Album of the Year. In 2003, she followed up with her next studio release, Stumble Into Grace, which continued to showcase her songwriting prowess. The album received praise for its emotive storytelling and reached the U.S. country top 10, further cementing Harris's reputation as a formidable artist. Harris's collaborative efforts with Mark Knopfler resulted in the album All the Road Running in 2006, which received widespread acclaim and achieved success on both sides of the Atlantic. Their partnership brought forth a rich blend of their individual strengths, earning praise from critics and fans alike. The album's single This Is Us further solidified their collaboration's success, reaching high positions on various music charts. There's a valley of sorrow in my soul. In 2008, Harris released the solo album All I Intended to Be, produced by her ex-collaborator and husband Brian Ahern. The album featured a mix of original material and cover tunes, showcasing Harris's versatility as an artist. The project received positive reviews and reached the top five of the U.S. Country Albums chart. The album's success propelled her back into the top five of Billboard's Country Albums chart, reaffirming her status as a country music icon. Also, while she had previously contributed to various film soundtracks, it wasn't until 2008 that she penned her first original song for the film Nights in Rodanthe. Inspired by the film's poignant narrative and coastal setting, her composition added depth to the cinematic experience. Continuing her creative journey, Harris released her fourth self-composed album, Hard Bargain, in 2011. Produced by Nashville's Jay Joyce, the album explored themes of Southern culture and personal introspection. Despite occasional critiques of her songwriting, Hard Bargain achieved success on various charts, reaffirming Harris's enduring influence in the music industry. 
It was her highest charting solo album since 1980. It reached number three on the country albums chart and cracked the top 20 on the pop albums chart, solidifying her position as a musical force to be reckoned with. Old Yellow Moon, a duet album with former hot band member Rodney Crowell, continued her streak of success, earning another top 10 spot on the country albums chart and winning her 13th Grammy Award in 2014. Her collaboration with Rodney Crowell continued with The Traveling Kind, released in 2015, which earned them a second Americana Music Award for Duo Group of the Year. The album received widespread acclaim, further cementing Harris's legacy as a pioneering figure in country and Americana music. In 2016, Harris was honored with a tribute concert, The Life and Songs of Emmy Lou Harris, celebrating her contributions to music. The event was later released as both a DVD and a live CD, showcasing her enduring impact on the music industry. Emmy Lou Harris's personal life and activism. Emmy Lou Harris has been married and divorced three times throughout her life. Her first marriage to Tom Slocum, though brief, brought forth her daughter. Throughout the early years of her career, Harris juggled motherhood and music, often taking her daughter on tour with her. Despite her love for performing, she expressed concerns about the road's suitability for raising children. Reflecting on her experiences, she remarked, I don't think the road is good for kids. Once in a while it's fun, like a trip to Disneyland, but not as a way of life. In 1977, Harris found love again and exchanged vows with her producer at the time, Brian Ahern, in a quaint ceremony at Ahern's home in Halifax, Nova Scotia. The couple then settled in the Studio City neighborhood of Los Angeles, California, where they welcomed their second child, Megan, in 1979. However, their marriage eventually ended in 1984, prompting Harris to make a fresh start in Nashville, Tennessee. We've all known down here the taste of joy. In 1985, Harris found companionship once more, this time with songwriter and record producer Paul Kennerly. The couple embraced domestic life, residing in a charming older home near Nashville's Music Row neighborhood. However, like her previous marriages, this union also came to an end, and they divorced in 1993. Her personal and professional life intertwined in a fascinating journey through the music industry. Despite the ups and downs in her romantic life, Harris has always maintained strong family bonds. She cherishes her role as a grandmother, with her granddaughter born in 2009 and her grandson following in 2012. Family has always been central to Harris's life, and she shared a close relationship with her parents. Tragically, she lost her father in 1993 due to an aortic rupture, marking a profound loss in her life. However, her mother remained a constant source of love and support until her passing in 2014. Harris fondly recalled her mother's presence, describing her as just about my best friend and highlighting her remarkable ability to create a warm and welcoming home environment. Beyond her jolly relationship with her family, Harris also found joy in promoting women's rights and addressing humanitarian issues. In the late 1990s, she took part in Sarah McLachlan's groundbreaking Lilith Fair concert series, which spotlighted female music artists, showcasing the diverse talents of women in the industry. Building on her passion for humanitarian causes, since 1999, Harris has spearheaded an annual benefit tour known as Concerts for a Landmine Free World. These tours raise funds in support of the Vietnam Veterans of America Foundation's VVAF, mission to aid innocent victims of conflicts worldwide and raise awareness about the global landmine crisis. Throughout the years, Harris has collaborated with esteemed artists like Joan Baez, Mary Chapin Carpenter, and Willie Nelson to bring attention to this vital cause. Her dedication to social and humanitarian issues extends beyond the stage. Any parent hopes for their child, but I have to say that my parents, for all their reservations... In 2011, she became a member of the newly formed Commission on the Humanities and Social Sciences of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. This initiative aims to foster research in the humanities and social science fields, highlighting the importance of these disciplines in addressing contemporary challenges. Aside from her musical endeavors, Harris has a deep love for animals, particularly dogs, her childhood dream of establishing a dog rescue became a reality in 2004 when her beloved pet dog, Bonaparte, passed away. To honor his memory, Harris founded Bonaparte's Retreat, a Nashville-based dog rescue dedicated to saving stray dogs from shelters and finding them loving forever homes. The rescue also provides care for elderly or sickly dogs in need, 
Bonaparte's retreat partners with the Metro Nashville Animal Care and Control Facility, rescuing dogs and offering them a second chance at life. Harris actively raises funds for the rescue through benefit concerts, leveraging her music to support her passion for animal welfare. Additionally, the rescue collaborates with programs that pair troubled youth with foster animals, offering them therapeutic companionship and valuable life lessons. Through her tireless efforts, Harris continues to make a positive impact on both the musical landscape and the well-being of animals in need. Reflections and where Emmylou Harris is today. Emmylou Harris reminisces about the pivotal role played by Rodney Crowell in her musical journey, attributing their partnership to a stroke of luck. It all began when Harris stumbled upon a cassette tape containing Crowell's songs, intended for Anne Murray's album. One of those songs, Bluebird Wine, found its way onto Harris's debut album, marking the beginning of their collaboration. Crowell soon became a part of Harris's band, The Hot Band, and their friendship blossomed, leading to a fruitful partnership as songwriters and musicians. Together, they navigated the music scene of the time, performing in clubs and honing their craft. Despite not having a breakthrough hit record, record labels were supportive, fronting the costs for their performances and recordings, believing in their talent and potential. Reflecting on those early days, Harris acknowledges the invaluable support she received from her team, including her record company, manager, producer, and band members. Their encouragement and belief in her abilities bolstered her confidence and fueled her passion for music. Amidst the whirlwind of experiences, Harris was also learning the ropes of making records, evolving as an artist with each song recorded and each show performed. During this period, Harris was primarily a song picker, relying on her keen ear for folk music to select songs that resonated with her. Crowell, however, played a significant role in introducing her to new material, often sharing his compositions with her first. Their creative synergy created a fertile ground for musical exploration, with songs seemingly finding their way to them effortlessly. While Harris had initially focused on interpreting songs rather than writing her own, she eventually found herself drawn to songwriting. Although she didn't consider songwriting a prerequisite for being an artist, she began to explore her own creative voice, collaborating with fellow musicians like Crowell, Kate, and Anna McGarrigal, and others. In 2021, Nonesuch Records delighted fans by releasing the long-awaited live album titled Ramble in Music City, The Lost Concert. This gem was recorded with Emmylou Harris and the Nash Ramblers back in 1990, but remained shelved until its unveiling in 2021, giving fans a chance to experience a piece of musical history that had been tucked away for over three decades. In a recent interview with Clash magazine in the same year. And she kind of admitted she is one of the most graceful, uh, beautiful uh, women and people. Harris shared that she had taken a step back from songwriting. She expressed that she no longer felt the same urgency or need to write songs, signaling a shift in her creative process. While she values the art of songwriting, she doesn't believe that artists should feel obligated to write all their own material. Instead, she views co-writing as an opportunity to connect with fellow musicians and enjoy the creative process. Despite this change, Harris remains an active performer, continuing to captivate audiences with her timeless music and live shows. Ultimately, Harris emphasizes the importance of being open to diverse forms of artistic expression and collaboration. Thanks for watching. See you in our next video.